Welcome back to chapter 26 in module 6. In this video we're going to kind of put together some of the big picture understanding of the different structures that we're part of and how we can make sure that we can keep track of them more easily in our head. So as a reminder of topics that are both in chapter 19 of OpenStax Astronomy, but that we covered at different times and for different reasons. So far, we have talked in this class about two ways of measuring distances in astronomy. Parallax we talked about in the end of Module 4, and it can be used to get measurements to nearby stars within the Milky Way galaxy. It is useful for figuring out what our local solar neighborhood looks like, our closest neighbors star-wise, in a little tiny patch of the galaxy. We then talked about at the beginning of chapter 25 the period luminosity relation for Cepheid variable stars, which helps us get the distance to star clusters that contain these Cepheid variables both inside our galaxy, the way that Harlow Shapley did to make a map of the Milky Way, and to nearby galaxies like Edwin Hubble did for the Andromeda galaxy. But even that has a limitation as well. Cepheid variable stars are a single very bright star, but we won't be able to measure those in distant galaxies. And so how do we measure objects at even larger distances than these two methods allow us? So to answer this question, we actually have to go back to an idea from chapter five, the Doppler effect or Doppler shift. Vesto Slipher was a scientist who was focused on getting the spectrum of different galaxies at a time when we didn't know that they were galaxies, so these were, these were nebulae, basically, um, and getting the Doppler shift of those spectra. So this was in 1913, a decade before Edwin Hubble measured a distance um, to Andromeda Galaxy, Vesto Slipher had already determined the blue shift of Andromeda to determine that it was moving towards us. We've mentioned already in this module that Andromeda is in fact on a collision course with the Milky Way, and so we are moving towards each other. The measurement of distance is not the same thing as the measure of speed toward or away from us. However, when we are talking specifically about distant galaxies, what Vesto Slipher also found in his data is that objects that were all considered these spiral galaxy, uh, spiral nebula idea, we didn't know that they were galaxies, but objects that all looked like they were probably the same object, but bigger ones had a small redshift and smaller ones had a big redshift, told Vesto Slipher that there was some kind of pattern here. So higher redshifts corresponded with smaller apparent size. So if we imagine that the five objects shown on the left of our slide are all the same overall true size, what does it mean in terms of their distance from us if they look smaller to us? Hopefully you thought to yourself or even said out loud that means they're farther away, right? If we look down any street that we might be near, cars that are parked right near um, our window are going to look bigger, and cars that are right at the edge of our distance, our, uh, our vision, are going to look smaller. So what Vesto Slipher started to find in his data is that for these galaxies, the farther aw away they were, the faster away from us they appeared to be moving. So Edwin Hubble followed up with this and brought Milton Humison on board to measure the distances to connect that information with Vesto Slipher's Doppler shift data. Now Hubble and Humison were measuring distances both with Cepheid variables, the way that we've talked about, and using other methods that are in our textbook in chapter 19 if you're curious, but are outside of our curriculum um, for this course. And so they were getting a different piece of information, but once these two pieces of information were brought together, 
speed information from the Doppler shift and distance information from Cepheid variables or some other method, we found a very important trend. The farther the galaxy was away from us, the faster it was moving away from us. All of these positive velocities mean objects moving farther away from us. On the left, the red points are replicated on the right um, in the bottom left corner to show how important it is to get a wide range of distances to get a more accurate um, trend line. And what we're seeing is something called Hubble's Law. At this point, that's what it is um, referred to as. Where the, let me go back a slide, the trend line, especially the one in part B, the black trend line, can be described with a simple equation that the velocity, the up and down y variable, is equal to the slope of that line times the distance, the horizontal axis or the x variable. So if you've ever taken a class and learned about the equation for a line, y equals mx plus b might sound familiar to us. In this case, because it goes through 0, 0, there's no y-intercept. If something is zero distance away from us, it is also not moving, as in the Milky Way galaxy is not moving away from the Milky Way galaxy. And so we get a, um, an equation for that trend line that is the velocity is equal to h naught, h with a little subscript zero or naught, n-a-u-g-h-t, uh, times the distance. And that h variable is called the Hubble constant. So let's take a moment and make sure we understand some key things here. First of all, why are all of those galaxies redshifted? We're measuring Doppler shift, just redshift in their spectrum. That is happening because they are moving away from us. That connection, that first question, we can answer using our chapter five understanding of Doppler shift. Now, the question of why they are moving away from us is one that we're starting to think about in this module. The universe itself is expanding. Everything is moving away from everything else because space itself is getting larger. That is an idea that we'll be talking about in chapter 29 coming up very soon. The question of why the universe is expanding is one that is much more difficult to answer. It doesn't take just five or six um, words to answer, but we will think about it in chapter 29. The other important thing to point out is Hubble's law is a method of getting distance because it is fairly easy to get the Doppler shift of a very distant galaxy. So if we go back a slide, if we get the Doppler shift, that gives us a measurement of the velocity of the vertical axis. And so let's say, for example, that we measure a Doppler shift corresponding with about 15,000 kilometers per second. We would go over to where the curve is and we would say, okay, according to Hubble's law, that galaxy is a distance of about 90 million light years from us. That is how that process would work. So although Doppler shift for an individual star cannot directly measure a distance, because of the expansion of the universe, Doppler shift is part of this process of getting the distances to far away galaxies through Hubble's law, through this relationship. And this is only a useful method if we accurately know the slope of that curve or the slope of that trend line. The picture here on our slide is actually showing us recent sets of measurements from different spacecraft missions and what the Hubble constant is from those spacecraft missions. It is important for us to recognize that the vertical axis only goes from 64 to 78 in the units that the Hubble constant uses. It's um, kilometers per second per megaparsec. We don't need to know those units. But for a long time, it's been kind of agreed that it's somewhere in the 70s. But recent measurements have shown that the Hubble constant may actually be a different number. And we scientists are working on figuring out what the correct number is and recognizing that if those, line, those points are not in a straight line, 
then the curve will change over time as we look further and further back in time. And that's something to be aware of as well. Okay, so Hubble's Law becomes the third distance method that we are covering in our course. And it is worth recognizing that the distance ranges are approximate and are really trying to highlight for us the fact that these three methods that I've that I've shown us don't all overlap with each other. There are absolutely other distance measurements that are in our textbook and even more beyond that that astronomers use to get distance, but they're all smaller details that aren't in our curriculum and these cover an understanding that distance requires us to use a tool that is appropriate for what we're trying to measure. I'm not going to use a ruler to get the measured distance between Grand Rapids and Chicago, I will use a different method. We can't use parallax to get the measurement of a distant galaxy, we have to use a different method. Okay, so now that we are starting to recognize that distances can be measured of different ranges, parallax for nearby stars, Cepheid variables for faraway stars and nearby galaxies, Hubble's law for faraway galaxies, we can start to put ourselves into a more understandable structure of things that we are part of. So I will have a deeper look video on our galactic address using the um, uh, interactive zoomable map of the images shown here on this slide. So the link that you can see here is going to bring you to a, um, a static image that you can zoom and move through. And I will record a video going through that and making sure that we understand it. So the galactic address starts with all of the locations that we are part of. So if we think about it, we live on Earth. We don't live on Mars or Venus, we live on Earth. We live in the solar system. That's the star system that we're part of. We're not part of the Vagan system or the Rigel system. We're part of the solar system. And we're in the Milky Way galaxy. We aren't in Andromeda galaxy. We're in the Milky Way galaxy. Those are all part of our galactic address. If we were, for example, trying to write a letter to somebody on the other side of the universe, we would need to tell them the address to send a letter back to us. The local group, shown here in a somewhat hard to parse, but um, still complete um, diagram of the local group, is our local galaxy cluster. It's the galaxy cluster that we are part of, it doesn't have a very exciting name, the local group, but there are other galaxy clusters like the Virgo cluster that we are not part of. And then the largest coherent structure in the universe. And what we really mean by that is as the universe expands, the last big structure that sort of still stays together through gravity is called a galaxy supercluster which is several different galaxy clusters that are all somewhat gravitationally bound. We live in the Laniakia supercluster. So, again, I'll make a deeper look video of this and kind of highlight these different structures. But at the very largest scales, we live in a universe that is infinite in all directions. There is a limit to the observable or visible universe, but the true universe is infinite in size. So any method of trying to map it out is just mapping enough to get the overall statistics of what the structure generally looks like, and then applying that same overall structure to be um, going off in roughly all directions. Illustrious is one of the largest undertakings to map out the history of um, the universe with supercomputers. And the um, link here is to a kind of fly through of the data set published in 2014, which I will have in our, um, in our YouTube playlist as a supplementary video. 
The image it left is showing us the most massive supercluster that developed in that kind of volume of simulated universe. It is not trying to directly show us a specific known supercluster, like this is not Laniakia supercluster, but it is showing us the overall structure of that general size frame. These weird filament-like structures are what we see on the largest scales. There are over 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe, and each of those has roughly 200 billion stars. We live in our little tiny solar system, but we are part of so many amazing structures, and we will be talking about the universe, the formation of the universe, and the fate of the universe in chapter 29 coming up, and I want to make sure that we go into it with some kind of understanding of these different size scales. So, I will see you in chapter 29, and thanks for watching.